Dudes, what's happening? It's Trent here, and uh, today I've got for you a special request from Sketchbook Pro. As you know, they sponsor a lot of my videos, and they have specifically requested a weapons concept art tutorial. So I want to show you the practical application of how I go about designing a series of axes for a video game such as World of Warcraft or Diablo or something like that that I might have worked on in the past. There's a lot of handy tools that are exclusive to Sketchbook Pro that I didn't even have uh, back when I was doing a lot of that stuff uh, when I was working in-house at Game Studios. So I wanna share a lot of those with you guys today so it'll speed up your process and, and get you uh, some awesome weapons by the end of this if you follow along with me. I'll go a little bit into the philosophy of shape language and storytelling and weapon design as well. All right, so let's do it, let's jam. All right, so you just got back from your lunch break. You're still munching on uh, one of those uh, fried chicken tacos from Taco Bell, kicking back with your Code Red or Baja Blast Mountain Dew. You sit down at your desk and uh, you check your email. You got a new assignment, you got a task. You're working on the, the year's most anticipated game. Your E3 went well. Everybody's got high expectations for you to kick out some of the best weapons. This is your task now, it's on you to kick out the best medieval looking weapons that the video game industry has ever seen. No pressure, bro. What do you do? First thing you wanna do, pop open Sketchbook Pro. Ba bam Now one of the things that most people might not realize is that there are a lot more jobs for weapon designers, props, culture kits, environment concept. You know, the real, like the world building stuff. There's a lot of story that can go into these things. And there are a lot more jobs for people to do that in concept art than to say, be the character designer. Everybody wants to be the character designer. Everybody in the office is gonna be jocking for your job is if you're the character designer too. And there's honestly, it's a lot of pressure, a lot of reworks, a lot of uh, criticism, just epic proportions of criticism, especially nowadays. And so I always really enjoy doing things like weapons and armor designs and, and culture kits. It really gives you a chance to dig into the storytelling. And the place I start with when I got to do something like this, because you don't just design one axe and it goes in game. That's kind of a common misconception. You're going to need to create a sheet full of these. And the best place to start is with silhouettes. So you want to kind of do these really kind of blobby shapes. You want to really uh, pick up the essence of what kind of a weapon it is. If there's any story, I would check with your game designers and find out, is there like regions within your game that you could kind of base the architectural shape off of? Like if they have an architecture in their culture, then their shapes of their weapons might be similarly shaped as well. And, and don't, you know, don't let anybody tell you that following a story is limiting creatively. Uh, I think it takes a certain level of uh, story and, and influence to sort of fill in the blank page. You need some directive. Otherwise, you might be spending a lot of your time just doing designs that get rejected. And one of the awesome features about Sketchbook Pro is this uh, symmetry tool. And I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper here. Let me pause the, the time lapse here to dig in a little deeper. So the symmetry tool can be found up here in the top bar. You'll find it right next to the... Um, perspective grid and whatever this little squiggly button does. Anyway, click on that bad boy and you'll notice you get a couple of different options here. Uh, you, you, what's cool about it is it draws this little line down the middle and whatever you draw on one side gets reflected uh, perfectly in the other side. And pay no attention to my crummy little drawing here. But what's cool about this, and, and I highly recommend, especially if you're kind of new to Sketchbook Pro and you just want to kind of get drawing quickly, is go in and, and set up your uh, your symmetry tool and just start drawing some faces and you'll get some really neat uh, results from this immediately without having to do a copy paste or mirror effect like that sloppy old Photoshop has to make you do. And what's cool about this is uh, if you go in and you click on the second button here, you get a horizontal uh, effect. What's cool about this is like you can create some really interesting mandalas or uh, just interesting kind of uh, pattern work. And if you couple this with my tutorial about creating custom brushes, you can actually create singular brush strokes that look like you spent about 30 or 40 brush strokes, and that all compounds so dramatically. And this works with any color too, by the way. So you can get some, you'll see later in the video when I start digging into some of the pattern work for the axes, and uh, what you can do with this, uh, this feature and this effect, it's super cool. And it's actually just really fun to watch. I could just sit here and do mandalas, especially if you do them in time lapse. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's the stuff right there. So back to our thumbnails. Basically, what are we looking for here? You know, we're looking for one, we want to kind of do some kind of interesting new design. We don't want to just copy axes that we've seen before, but there is a kind of a consistency that you always see with axes. There's like the identifiable um, axe handle that sometimes has this curve to it. You know, maybe we want to accentuate that curve a little bit more. We want to give a, li a large variety of options to our art director, to our uh, whoever is our manager in, in, at this stage, and like whoever we have to report to. We want to show them that we're thinking outside of the box, but we don't want to just give them like three ideas. You know, with something like this, give them a whole sheet of ideas, man. Give them a whole sheet of silhouettes, little thumbnails, uh, copy and paste. One of the things you can do is uh, if you make a selection and you hit Command C and then Command V, it'll paste it down. Then you can rotate it or turn it or resize it. And you can create a variant off of that in initial silhouette or initial design that you had done. And sometimes that variant kind of takes on a life of its own. I tend to think of things very iteratively. I don't uh, just settle on one design. Unfortunately, uh, one of the byproducts of becoming a concept artist is that you never really get sold on any one idea. It's It, it tends to be hard for me to remain focused on a singular project for a lengthy period of time or uh, to work on a big, epic, long project because I tend to think so iteratively and I tend to think uh, so critically of the work that I've done. And, and uh, one of the biggest challenges that you'll face as a concept artist, I think, is dealing with the criticism, not attaching personal value to ideas and designs that you've done that may have been rejected because sometimes they inspire other ideas, they inspire other artists. Uh, one of the, probably the biggest part of the journey of a concept artist that I found is sort of accepting uh, the failures that I've had and, and some of the pieces that I've done that have been rejected, accepting that they just weren't right for that time because eventually somebody will do something similar, but they do it a slightly different way and it's popular and it's like, well, wait a minute, why did, the one I did get rejected, but the one he did, yeah, it's, it messes with your head, man. But eventually <laughs> you reach a point where as a concept artist, you're just doing it for the love of doing it. It's like, I just wanted to see what an ax looked like with brass knuckles on the end of it. You know, I just wanted to see what that would look like, you know, and also part of it is thinking in terms of the gameplay, like how is this used? You know, how is this weapon used? Is this weapon uh, being held by a very savage barbarian type of a guy that's a warmonger type of a guy? Are they, are they literally strapping shards of broken metal and other, you know, scraps of wasted metal uh, onto their axe heads so that they can rip at uh, whatever uh, they're attacking? They can rip at the flesh of it a little bit easier. If it's got all these extra chips out of it, you know, that tells a very different story than the more pristine, elegant looking gold uh, finished axe, you know, that looks like maybe it's from an Imperial Guard or somebody who ha has a standard issue. They, they manufacture, you know, 3000 of these and they pass them out to every, you know, soldier, first class soldier, you know, who's on the front lines. You know, that's going to look like a very different axe than somebody who, you know, hunts wild animals, you know, out in a swamp using, you know, nothing but old, uh, uh, broken, you know, machine parts or something of that nature. Now, all that's fine and good. And I had a lot of freedom with this one. I wasn't bound to any shape language or any distinct culture kits. This isn't specifically for, you know, the world of Diablo, for example. You know, if it were, I probably would infuse specific like Laorix uh, kind of patterns, uh, symbols that you see across Leoric's dungeon, if these are axes that you might pick up in that region. I never felt like, even with Diablo, that we went enough along the lines of consistent storytelling. I feel like the future of game development is is when you start to see uh, specific patterns that are exclusive to that region. When you look at... Uh, Lord of the Rings and all the, the appendices and the behind the scenes stuff, they'll, they'll spend a do, uh, an hour documentary showing you all the thought process behind the shape language and pattern work for a culture kit, such as like the dwarves or, uh, you know, something of that nature. And they'll tell you, you know, Hey, look, we chose these shapes and these shapes are consistent across all weapons from that culture kit, because that tells the viewer in a subtle way that you might not even notice. And this is part of the reason why those films are, are 
is still recognized as some of the greatest because of the attention to detail. Because if a character shows up wearing a pin that has a, uh, you know, a horse head on it, and it's in a similar design language as the writers of Rohan, you might very well make a little assumption about the character's history that he had actually traveled to that location and possibly won favor with someone from that location. And so that that should be true across all locations within your game to have that consistency of vision to say, oh, these are like these sun patterns are representative of this palace or these people who worship the sun or they have a, a kind of... Um, strange obsessive religion or they find that they like they soak in the sun or they bathe in the sun before every fight just so that they could uh, go into battle feeling empowered as if in some way they're empowered by the sun and that is a symbol of power to them when you think about what is a symbol of power or what is a symbol of a culture's religion uh, or what they fight for and what they believe if they believe in deities when they go into battle. These are questions that you should ask your game designers. Or if you're just designing these for fun, ask yourself, you know, what do these characters who would wield these weapons believe? You know, in this case, I kind of played around a little bit with this like almost spider web motif. I was thinking maybe there could be some spider web kind of influence. And you even see it with like the, the hanging dangling uh, uh, tassels off of the bottom. Uh, but it ended up I ended up reworking this design specifically because it was almost a little bit too uh, high tech for something that a uh, sort of a native or a, a, a smaller tribe uh, tribesman warrior might might carry. I also realized that some of these axes were getting kind of flat and uh, the lug where the axe connects to the shoulder. Well, it needed to be rounded out a little bit and just, just added a little bit more curve. And it, you'll also notice that I, this was over the course of a couple of days. I, I uh, tend to just work on these videos and a lot of my YouTube stuff after I finish my work for the most part. Um, and so I, it ends up being multiple sessions and I kind of had to go back in and round out those a areas a little bit more um, around the lug and, and just the, uh, the the start to really work in some of the 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 turning of the forms and how the pieces of metal connect. You know, I think it's it's a, an important distinction to recognize if you're doing something that's sort of science fiction, you don't have to worry too much about the um, the the nuts or bolts or the you know what kind of welding process was done, but when you're doing something that's more medieval, you have to really think about it in terms of what would this feel like if a if a, a blacksmith really hammered this out, you know? And how do these pieces actually fit together? You know, you have to think about these things because there's going to have to be a modeler who builds it. He's going to have to make sense of your design. Usually with weapons, uh, you can get away with doing flat kind of designs, but you still want to imply some lighting. And, and this is where Sketchbook Pro really shines. You can get some nice texture work in there using a lot of the texture brushes. For the most part, I'm just using the pencil brush because this is just raw, straight up concept art. But when you need that kind of texture, it's there for you. And that's, that's really one of the things that I've come to really love about Sketchbook Pro. If I've got to do a lot of design work, if I've got to actually create a character or a weapon or an environment, Generally, I, I tend to go with grayscale. I tend to just do things in gray because then I'm not thinking about how is this material reflecting off of this surface or how the light off of the surface. Those are things that need to be worked out, but they can also be like painting technique can be a distraction when you're trying to think of a good design. You almost, these are really two different disciplines entirely, you know, and by separating them out and just kind of going, okay, this is just about the design of things. This is just about the patterns. This is just about the symmetry. This is just about the 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 construction of this object. By eliminating the the rendering and and the technicalities of painting, and focusing on just the design itself, you free yourself to think a little bit more freely. And that's just my personal take on it. Different artists work differently. Uh, I work with. Uh, Another guy that uh, he prefers to just go straight to color right away. That's just how he thinks. And uh, and this is just a, a technique and a, a process that's really kind of worked out really well for me. I, I realize that later it's um, uh, I, 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 I can just add color in at a different time. I don't have to have the color in there right away. Um, the other thing I want to go back a little bit briefly because I'm, I'm 
uh, I'm realizing that I didn't talk too much about this, but the symmetry, the factor of what, like, what does that communicate? When you're doing something with a lot of symmetry, it implies a great deal of intended construction. And what I mean by that is, uh, remember earlier in the video, I was talking about the barbarian that might be hunting animals, wild animals in the swamp versus the imperial axe, you know, and what those differences are, are really going to come up when you start dealing with things like symmetry. For the savage barbarian, he's just got to get a, a, a weighted blade that's balanced so that he can leap out of the bushes and hunt his prey quickly and efficiently. Whereas the needs of the imperial soldier are going to be well one and on the manufacturing side you know the the blacksmith has probably got a, a large group of people working with him so he can work with more uh expensive tools to make sure that it's uh balanced and, and perfectly symmetrical on either side it's a little bit more machined almost and he would probably have a group of people so that they could kind of assembly line build these axes with specifically the symbol of the kingdom for instance or you know the the what that kingdom represents or stands for you know this is why it would be so valuable for you to under have an understanding of what are the people that are going to be using this tool this weapon uh, what do they believe in? You know, what do they stand for? And if they stand for just their kingdom or their their king's family crest or something of that nature, then that should be represented in the weaponry as well. Now I've got I've got myself about a sheet full of interesting designs. You know, from the tomahawk inspired type of design to the the imperial kind of a double sided axe, and I want to start adding color. And there are there are a few different ways that you could do this. You could create a colorized layer. You could create an overlay layer. Uh, I started actually playing around with an idea of, of uh, colorizing the background so that it's not just like all this white blasting you in the face. So I wanted to get a little bit of gray back there, uh, darken the canvas. You can do this all through the uh, image adjust uh, function. If you go to the top of the screen, you have an image drop down and go down to adjust. You can adjust hue, saturation, balance, levels, things of that nature. And I just found a kind of a, a consistency that worked for me. And I don't like to dig in too much to the uh, material definition, especially with concept art for something like this, unless if it's um, we already know what it what it's got to look like, you know, uh, I, I'll give you a great example. I was working on Diablo and uh, one of the other concept designers was tasked with doing an axe design. And I had been doing a ton of these, but he really wanted to do this one particular axe. And so he had spent, I think, two or three days rendering the heck out of this one axe concept. And it was a painting. And, uh, and I didn't give him too much uh, flack for this. I was a little bit more of a senior guy. I'd been doing this a lot longer. And so, and his, his paintings are beautiful. So, you know, don't stop a guy who's got a lot of, of, uh, enthusiasm for what he's doing. But the fact was, is that when this axe would be actually seen in game, you've seen the axes in Diablo 3. They're very small. Um, and probably I would say the texture isn't going to have more than a 128 by 128. So you can't really get into it that much. Why, why would you have one of your best concept artists spending three days on an axe that's going to be you know, a blink of an eye. Uh, it was it was not a special axe in any way, but he had designed it. He had done all this concept art for this this singular axe as if it was going to be in a cinematic. And this was a, a it was there are many reasons to do a concept or to allocate a resource uh, on a team toward developing something. But in this case, it was a bit of a waste of his time to do that because ultimately the axe could not look that detailed or interesting in game for one, and two, he could have spent a lot of that time developing uh, more axes, developing a, a, a multitude of ideas for designs for axes. And this is kind of an example of where I feel like a lot of game developers get caught up in illustration rather than doing good concept design. It's not a very glamorous gig in reality. You don't get to just design one axe, hand it over, you know, spend a week on one axe, hand it over, and then that goes right into the game and everybody talks about what a genius you are. No, it doesn't really work that way. That's not a reality. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just lost probably half of my subscribers, but I'm going to spit the truth. I'm going to spit the truth, man. It's not glamorous, but I will say it's a hell of a lot of fun.
I've gotten a chance to design uh, tons of um, incredible locations for a lot of fun games and and tell a lot of subtle stories that people still haven't figured out that are hidden and buried away and nobody will ever know about the true story behind you know some of the locations in World of Warcraft or Diablo three you know those are those are stories that are implied in the architecture and in the hidden details and the love and passion of a lot of uh, the environment team, we just snuck in a lot of cool, cool story elements into those worlds. And uh, that's that's joy enough, man. That That is a lot of, uh, I feel a lot of pride and joy in having done that. And the same principles that I've talked about in terms of shape language and storytelling in your designs for these axes, these same principles and ideas apply to everything from characters to pouches to uh, weapon designs of all kinds, high-tech, low-tech, medieval, futuristic, it doesn't matter. Our architecture, um, chest, treasure chests, everything. So in conclusion, I want to encourage you to dig into the storytelling of your weapon designs. More important, That is more important than anything else. Tell that story through silhouette through patterns, through shape language, and through the construction of the, the the object itself, you know? Is there stuff like strapped onto this thing? Is there like old bones attached, like tied to this thing? Is it like a some kind of a voodoo witch doctor ceremonial kind of a weapon? You know, that story can be told completely 100% visually, and that's what's going to make a good design. You know, it's not about the rendering. It's not about how this metal looks under certain light. It's about the design of the structure of the device, of the of the weapon itself. And what does that communicate? What is that? What story is that telling? And does it also look pretty damn cool? Is it going to be exciting for the player to pick up? And if all those answer, if all those questions are answered in your thumbnail, that's when you take it to color. That's when you start to invest in the design. And if you do need a side view of it, then you can dig in and do a little side view of it. So that about does it for me. I want to thank you guys so much for stopping by. If you're hardcore and you would love to hear more of my tips on conceptual design and illustration and more about how to use Sketchbook Pro, please uh, swing on over to my Gumroad. You can find a, a link in the, uh, the text field below the video and you can find lengthy, meaty videos, tutorials, workshops, brushes, uh, gradient maps, uh, all kinds of fun toys for you to play around with with your digital art experience. And uh, <laughs> remember, dudes, if you're going to be drawing a bunch of awesome, badass axes for an epic AAA game, draw a bunch of badass, epic axes for a AAA game with some freaking passion, man. Yeah.